to cinema and documentary director. I'm gonna push this conversation about documentalist associations and guilds. And today, first of May, as the, the day of workers' solidarity is a very good day to do this. And we're gonna talk about the solidarity on documentary work. And in the first part of the conversation, we'll be talking about Ukrainian nonfiction cinema guild. Second part will be about Estonian documentary guild. And the third will be on documentary association of Europe. It's Han National um, Association of Documentalists on European level. So let's get to the first part. We're going to speak about Ukrainian nonfiction cinema guild with Lubak Norozok. She's a producer of documentary and feature films and a representative of nonfiction cinema guild. Can you please talk about a little bit about this? Well, thank you. I'm really happy to see everyone. You were ahead of me to greet everyone on this collaboration. Of course, the pandemic has changed all our all our plans, but Ukrainian Nonfiction Cinema Guild, we realized that we need this kind of organization quite a long time ago, and we see that the situation in Ukraine regarding the support of documentary films is kind of comes in the last place. It, same for producers and for distributors, but the society around this, the community is way more active than it seems at the first glance, and they're very supportive for each other. They're also very supportive in the feature sphere. Maybe it's because of the specifics of the production and you know, financial issue also plays a role. However, let's say it's more about the specifics of work. With 12 pitching that happened at the end of last month, summer, we really didn't have any more patients and we were quite fed up being just reactional and just waging some crisis management and just reacting to problems and some issues. We were always speaking our mind, but we realized it was the time to connect our forces and start an organization with a distinct voice. So we started a non-function cinema guild in fall last year, we have a Facebook group that everyone can join and we'll talk about it later, but these people are directors, producers, directors of photography, directors of sound, editors, programmers of festivals and distributors. So basically all kinds of professionals in nonfiction, cinema and one of our own main mission is providing the proper functionality and proper life for this year of movies. We want to support, stimulate and teach others in documentary. We want to make sure that the viewers see the documentary art as well. And with the end of reaching these goals, we also raise an awareness about the issue. We had a lot of tasks and goals that we wanted to achieve the nearest time. However, the main ones were four. Those are lobbying, legal support, awareness, and informational support. First of all, lobbying is one of the main goals and is the lobbying of the documentary movie interest in Ukraine. We know that Ukrainian legislation is 
We know that legislation in Ukraine is really not perfect in any kind of cinema here, but there are many things that are not functioning at the moment. And documentary production is quite, quite peculiar in Ukraine. And unfortunately, we cannot play by the fiction rules. There is no pre-production and um, there is much more development. So it's quite a different structure of work. There is no fixed timeline for production that can be created in the fiction movies. It's not something that can be thoroughly planned. Therefore, collaboration between Ukrainian documentaries and international partners is really hard because signing any kind of contract, it implies a lot additional movements and we're just, we have to solve way more questions than we should have been. So this is also why we need legal support. It's, it's, we don't mean legal support as defending us, defending us in court. It's, I hope that in future, it's not only our organization that will be doing this, but it is because the legislation is so imperfect. We are all running into these issues during the production of the movies and we have to create our own paths and create in our own legal templates of contracts, which is quite difficult. And we all need to join our efforts in order to focus on the quality of work and not on the paperwork. I also want to say that uh, YouTube streaming and Facebook streaming is available for this event, as well as the DocuDays website, and the viewers will be able to pose their questions uh, on the website. Please continue about the lobbying and how the Guild as a professional organization can influence and impact creation of policies and how can they be lobbied. Well, again, there are specific governmental agencies that are working to support cinema production. It's mostly Dershkino right now. And of course, there are certain, there are different forms of financial support of documentary. And actually, Dershkino, the state, support is in the last place. Of course, we want to impact and influence the creation of expert board for documentary movies. We want to support development financially as well, because documentary development and production takes way more time than feature films. Because certain features that are very vivid for fiction movies are not relevant for documentary at all. And there are certain requirements in legislation. For example, at the moment, legisl by Ukrainian legislation at the moment, we are not able to get any financial support for development at all. At least that's how we know. We wanted to pose the question yesterday to the head of Dershkino, but she was not in the live stream. And apart from lobbying and legal support, it's also informational support. We're working, we're talking about Ukrainian guild in particular, and we want to spread the information, spread the word, because a lot of the members are participating in different programs and visiting a lot of film festivals and we need to share this information and make sure that people see it. We also want to 
raise the awareness inside the market and build connections with the organizations and guilds outside Ukraine, which we will be talking about in the next parts of our stream today. And um, for those who do not know about Ukrainian non-function, here's how you can join. Well, at the moment, we're not officially created as a legal entity. We have a few reasons for that. It's our sort of a pilot stage. It's about a couple dozen activists that are working together for this. And we are testing out different formats at the moment. Any kind of cinema professional can join us. We have a form that you need to fill out. We can, we'll provide the link on Facebook in comments and in the event of the stream. So we will publish, we will publish the link for this form to join that you will need to fill out uh, on Facebook and on the website. Well, as I said, we have internal communication channel through a Facebook page. We have an email newsletter that helps us communicate. We also have an official page of Ukrainian nonfiction cinema guild in Ukrainian on Facebook. It has all the information about us. It also has information about this particular event. You can pose any kind of questions that you want. You can also fill out the form and join us in our organization. We will be able to consider your application within a month. And we have quite a lot of people that want to join us. We have this horizontal democratic system as we're not that many people right now, we can afford that. Of course, later on, we will need to create more structured and um, regulated system within the organization. So far as we are not, as a legal entity uh, and we're not fundraising any official funds. Um, however, we are getting some charity donations from certain, and it's mostly just helping us with some services like legal services or organizational services. So anyone can help us, but not in terms of financial support, or, but just professional support or giving us any kind of other support. I think it's really important, but speaking personally of you as a producer and as a cinematographer, why is it important for you to be part of this? I think I've spoken of, spoke of it before, and I think I would just set up trying to get any kind of answers and get some work done, but it's really hard to do it. We're trying to, you know, it's really hard to try and create your own ways of creating something and you want to have some freedom of creation. And all of the paperwork and other support like legal support or issues like reasonable pay and reasonable work ethics and work environment or any kind of support of uh, any issues that might come up in the production process. It's just, you know, it's about creating this comfortable environment and decent environment for work. So it's kind of a creating the field and the environment for all these um, particip participants. Well, as a participant of that story, I can say that when I was a student at film school, that, that was a big advantage and I have much better understanding that we need to collaborate. And if we collaborate, we can create new value or greater value. 
as opposed to us working on our own. Right. That's very weird because I started listening. We want to thank DocuDays that they will they were able to create this event despite the pandemic and they keep working on spreading the awareness and educating people in terms of cinema and letting people like us talk about our initiatives. Well, we didn't have any questions from the viewers yet, so I suggest we move on to Estonian Documentary, Documentary Guild because it's this guild exists for quite a while now and it's quite effective in lobbying and raising awareness which are also the goals for Ukrainian guild. It's really interesting for us, how do you manage this and how um, do you manage all of the now um, board of board member of Estonian Documentary Guild, Helika Pikov. Uh, she is also a filmmaker, curator and cultural manager will join us. Hi Helika. Hello. Thank you for joining us and agreeing to speak about your own experience. Please share with us how does your guild function and how do you work within it? All right. Uh, I uh, prepared a little short presentation, but after that, I would be happy to take all the questions as well. Uh, so my name is Heidi Kabikov. Uh, I'm a documentary director and cultural manager, uh, uh, as well as board member of the Estonian Documentary Guild. Uh, Estonian Documentary Guild was founded in 2012. Uh, it's an NGO. Uh, we have around 50 members and three people on the board. The board is chosen for two years. And most of our members are uh, documentary directors and producers. To become a member, uh, we have a very clear uh, rule or condition, let's say. Uh, the filmmaker must have made documentary film that has been broadcasted on TV or shown on a festival. So basically, we, we don't really have very strict rules to, to become a member. And many of, of our members are quite often involved in other kind of projects as well. Some of them make fiction films, some commercials, TV productions. But the focus of the guild uh, is, is creative documentary. So we have set uh, the aim that uh, we want to represent documentary filmmakers and documentary film as a distinct art form. So what are our goals? Uh, I think throughout these years, uh, uh, the most important thing has been building a community to create opportunities to exchange ideas and experiences. 
and also uh, to create the feeling of uh, belonging somewhere. Because very often documentary filmmakers are kind of uh, lonely wanderers. So the other thing, of course, what you uh, from the Ukrainian side mentioned as well, is to protect documentary filmmakers' interests. Lobbying. And also, whenever possible, putting up candidates for all kinds of decision making boards in Estonia. So, for example, in our culture in government, we have for years now always one person from the documentary guild. Then um, about the goals, um, of course, uh, raising general awareness uh, in the society about documentary filmmaking, about the process, the specifics of documentary filmmaking, but also ethical questions and, uh, and filmmakers' responsibility in all this. Uh, then, uh, quite a hard uh, problem to solve uh, distribution. And then, last but not least, uh, ranging educational meetings, courses, workshops. So, maybe the, uh, the organizers can show now the web page uh, of our summer school. This is uh, kind of a legendary event that we have been organizing from the very beginning. It's, um, let's say, it's an inspirational event. We invite um, guests uh, from other disciplines like uh, theater, music, dance, photography. We have um, lectures, um, we are watching films together, having parties together. It lasts for three days and it always takes place uh, on the countryside, outside of the city. And what's also important uh, through this event, uh, we've tried to uh, bridge the gap between our filmmakers' generations. Uh, Estonian documentary started uh, in the 60s. And some of these filmmakers, uh, these old directors, are still among us. But the younger ones, the new directors, uh, film school students, rarely have a chance to meet them and to see their films even. So summer school is also the place to, uh, to bring together filmmakers from all the generations that we have now. And that's also part of this, what I mentioned before, the, the, the community building. Now, another uh, initiative I would like to talk about uh, is a very fresh one. It's from uh, last year. Uh, we started uh, 2019. It's called Ice and Fire Docks. And this is a creative documentary workshop for Estonian and Finnish uh, filmmakers. It lasts for one year. We have three sessions and each session is three days. The reason to start uh, this workshop was that we discovered that um, there are so many options 
possibilities around the world uh, to participate in documentary uh, trainings, uh, workshops and so on. But um, Estonian projects, for some reason, are not selected there, not too often. And we figured out that probably um, our weakest point is somewhere in the development phase. That it's not about that we don't have good enough ideas or or we cannot make good films, but just in the beginning of the process, um, we are not perhaps able to develop the idea so that it would be understandable for international audience as well. So basically, Ice and Fire Docs is a platform uh, to develop the projects uh, to become more competitive in the international market. And as we have a very good cooperation with the Finnish Documentary Guild, uh, we decided uh, from the very beginning to involve uh, Finnish filmmakers as well. And the tutors are um, very well known national tutors like Mika Lobstrup, uh, Jesper Osmut, uh, Anes Klené. Yeah. So basically, uh, these are the main um, activities. Uh, and about the financing, our membership is very symbolic. It's 20 euros per year. That helps us to cover the costs of uh, accounting, web page, taxes, some general small things. But the board um, is working voluntarily without any fee. Uh, and when we have a concrete project or initiative, then we apply support from different funds. There are two of them in Estonia. Uh, one is Culture and Government of Estonia. And then Estonian Film Institute. And we, for example, this Ice and Fire Docs is uh, it's a collaboration with the Film Institute. They support it practically 100%. And we have a very good cooperation with our documentary film commissioner, Philip Cruzwell. Uh, so the communication is, is very open, it's very clear. And also the, the financing from the Film Institute um, is, is is quite well organized. The pitchings are open, everyone can participate. Uh, usually the um, every time there are two or three uh, experts from outside who are also deciding about the funding of specific projects. And uh, there's also uh, separate support for development and production. So I was kind of uh, surprised to hear that in Ukraine, as I understand, you don't have support for development. In our case, uh, the support is not too big. The, the mac I didn't hear. <laughs> There is really lack of support, but we're really interested to know how the financial support is happening in Estonia. Okay, so um, about the development, I will not go too much into detail in the numbers. But the maximum you can apply uh, for development is uh, 15,000 euros. 
and then you always have the other fund, the culture in the government. Um, more about the guild. Um, communication is big part of our work as well. We have a nicely working email list, uh, Facebook group, which is open. And um, in maybe two or three months, uh, we, we meet and discuss different topics. And just to give you um, a little bit broader look uh, where the Documentary Guild is located in Estonian film landscape. Uh, we have um, kind of we have kind of uh, been uh, divided by genre. That, for example, we have uh, Estonian Animation Union. Then uh, Estonian Film Industry Cluster, which is mainly. Uh, for uh, fiction and uh, feature film producers. And then Estonian Documentary Guild. The focus of these three is a little bit different. For example, the cluster is a lot about uh, lobbying, high budget industry projects, international co productions, and so on. But in the guild, uh, as I mentioned before, we quite often deal about, the, um, let's say, content and try to develop ourselves as uh, as filmmakers, as uh, as persons. And then, of course, uh, you probably as well in Ukraine. We have a lot of other organizations, but they're quite small. But for all of them, uh, the roof is our uh, filmmakers union. So if there is a discussion on the governmental level, then the filmmakers union uh, collects all the opinions, wishes, proposals and then brings them together uh, to the Minister of Culture. It's also important that the, the government has a dialogue partner. And Filmmakers Union has taken that responsibility. Thank you for such a detailed story. We have a question from the viewers. In particular, Nadia Prefan is asking, well, there's many questions about membership. Do you take applications? Do you take short film? directors or those that have only made one movie and also a question whether are there the same rules for full feature films and for short films also a question whether you were separating television documentary from creative documentary and whether television documentary representatives can also join your guild, those that actually create this documentary content, but for television use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, about uh, becoming a member. Uh, yes, um, we we have it, it. It can be also a short film that has been made uh, by the person who wants to join. Because some people have joined right after the film school. 
and film school students always participate our summer camps. So we, we really try to involve everyone, but, uh, but we don't want um, members who kind of like, a, I, I wouldn't like to say dead members, but the members who don't participate at all. So once in a while, we, uh, we ask people, like, do you still want to be a member? Or for now, we will, you know, take you out. So at the moment, this 50 is, is, is really like, I can say that most of them are actively participating. And we, we hope to grow, although almost most of the documentary filmmakers now are already members. About the financing. How about the television aspect here? That's a really good question because, because we've never had that discussion. <laughs> we, we, we haven't really drawn that border. Because the very first, you know, sentence in our web page also said that we, we support documentary as an, an art form. So, yes, some of our members are making also films or projects sometimes together with uh, TV. But as our public broadcaster, uh, their resources are so limited, then you cannot really say that you have documentary directors working in the broadcasters. So in Estonia, it's not really a problem that we have different groups and we have some kind of opposition. Thank you, Halik. Uh, I asked this because in our guild, we did have this discussion whether we should be a guild just for the documentalists that only work in creative sphere of documentary or we should be letting everyone join, you know, including people that should film some newsroom footage and some materials that are just for the television. So we were really interested to see your point of view here. I also wanted to ask, how do you make decisions within your guild? Uh, what are your general day-to-day -day process? You said that you're usually getting together once in two, three months, but how do you usually make decisions about the new members? And if you want to make some kind of a public statement or anything like, like that, how is that decided within the team? Mm -hmm. Well, the, we, we have kept it really simple. It's like pure democracy, but uh, just um, not to, uh, let's say, not to put every detail to the email list where people have too much information every day anyway. Then quite often the board, which is three people for two years, discusses first. And, and often we also make decisions. I cannot hear the translator. Are you still there? For how long are you choosing this word? It's two years. And then we have an open election. Uh, everyone can put up their candidature and uh, also uh, uh, be be chosen.
Thank you, Halika. It's very important. I see that we have quite a lot of viewers. I hope a lot of them want to join Ukrainian Nonfiction Cinema Guild and we really hope that your experience will be helpful for us and that at certain point we will be able to join Estonian and Finnish Documentary Guild and set up some kind of a workshop and have a party together, not an online party, but a live one when all the lockdown is over and we will be able to communicate in person and I'm sure we'll be able to do that. Now stay with us, we're just gonna move on to our next part of the conversation. We're gonna speak about Documentary Association of Europe that gets together documentalists from the whole Europe. We have Bridget Oshie with us here. She is the founder of this association and she is also head of industry at Doc Leipzig. Hi, Bridget, we're happy to see you. Hello, it's nice to see you all again too. I feel like I've spent the week at DocuDays even if I haven't left my um, own bedroom. Um, so, I'm not the, the alone the founder of the Documentary Association of Europe. I'm one of its co-founders, actually. There's more than one of me. So um, the association was founded in February, which is very recently, um, but it's born of conversations that have been going on for more than 12 months, um, which is that there was a definite need for a pan-European network that represents the interests of documentary filmmaking more generally in larger conversations about the um, future of audiovisual financing and distribution for sure, but also on a symbolic level to give us an opportunity for new methods of collaboration, new, um, new friendships to emerge. It also recognizes that um, maybe the one thing that we all have in common in the European audio or in the European audiovisual industry more generally but certainly specifically in the documentary field is that our point of common reference is that we're constantly working in change. So our systems are evolving, our financing sources are restructuring, our audiences are um, fracturing, and what we, the only thing we can say for sure is that things are always changing. So, um, based on that conversation, we realized that we needed a new, a new as association to emerge that was maybe somehow freed from the baggage of the old system that would allow new voices to emerge and also set agendas for things like the lobby. I think what, what for sure the Documentary Association of Europe has in common with the two other national associations that have spoken, or in the case of Ukraine Guild that spoke previously, is that we definitely had a lack of patience to expect things to change by themselves. We don't believe that structure is a self-regulatory or that it's possible for organizations and structures to be fair when left alone. We don't believe in this kind of capitalist or neoliberal thinking. Um, and we're fed up of also being reactionary, fed up of always saying no, instead of trying to create systems that maybe are more based around things like yes, and really, we are trying to find and develop a distinct voice and language that speaks for a lot of different parties in one voice in order to make change happen perhaps more quickly and more efficiently. Of course, it's extremely difficult when you consider that Europe is just, is like the official European Union, you're already spoke, speaking in, trying to speak in 22 languages. So that's that, or 16 languages, that's hard enough in itself. But still it's a, it's a goal that we think is important. When we also talk about the concept of Europe, we do not limit ourselves to thinking only within the, um, the framework of the European Union. We think of Europe as more of a greater geographical landmass, but also do not dictate the policy of entering the network or becoming a member based on what nationality you are, the, which passports you hold, or where your country of residence is. We think that European financing flows out into the international community much more widely as international films flow back to our audiences inside the European Union, which means that we must take a much more inclusive um, um, understanding of who can join the network. Also, um, 
like like my colleagues in Estonia and in Ukraine, we have three main main kind of mandates within the network of what we should be doing for our members. So those three ma mandates are, of course, building the community and network so that you have partners to exchange with on a pan-European and international level about what systems are working and what perhaps can be bettered or um, developed further. Advocacy and lobbying, because we will be participating in communication and communication and conversation, not just in Brussels with um, European funders, but we also see it as our job to represent the interests of European filmmaking also in places like Los Angeles in Asia and the extended global community. And of course, creating access to information and resources for sharing information about our different systems um, and about our different realities um, in a kind of collated, curated and um, understandable way. These are of course very big dreams and we are really just at the beginning of this journey. Um, so because we were just founded in February, we had actually the great luxury and the great, great lucky situation that we were able to um, launch face to face at the Berlinale of the European film market. And then we were even able to have a party afterwards, which now seems just so far, so far removed from the reality we find ourselves in. This also means that we've had to adapt and change um, our plans for how we thought um, the uh, the first 12 months of the organization would roll out. For example, um, we've faced really great difficulties in setting the legal structure for the organization as the employment office in, or the, um, the taxation offices in Germany were suddenly changed to employment offices in order to make sure that citizens would survive this crisis in, in ways with dignity and also access to financial resources should they have been made redundant in this process. So we've had to also develop on one hand a newfound patience um, to make our legal entities strong for a lot for longevity but on the other hand we've had this like wonderful digital um, renaissance let's say so we are already very active online um, we have meetings every friday that are open to members and non-members alike and we also have um individual consultations that you can book with people who've already um, showed a sign that they would like to um, be members. So that means that we're already consulting with people probably in more efficient and more radical ways than we would have if we'd been visiting film festivals right now. So this is very good. And all of this information that we're collecting through um, the consultations and through these Friday hangouts, as we call them, um, actually is a two it's a two-way conversation so on the one hand we're trying to share our expertise and our experts in the network with people who feel vulnerable and isolated in this unknown period but also it's giving us really great insight and access into the not only the psychology of the european marketplace but also the really great challenges that we face that will now inform the next steps of our um of our lobby work, which we think will start in, in more seriousness in the beginning of 2021. I wonder if there are any questions or if I should continue. I guess I continue. Um, yeah, so sure. Could you tell us a little bit about which bonuses the members of Guild have and Sure. What is the membership contribution and whether you have kind of, if you have group membership as well, for example, if Ukrainian Guild wants to join as a member, can they do that? Yes. So um, currently, so we have three tier, or actually four tier memberships um, um, entry levels, let's say. We also include film students. So actually, we don't mind if you've made a film or if you haven't made a film. That's actually irrelevant to us. We do want, um, I think, um, as, as Helika said, like no dead bodies around. <laughs> but we do don't mind if you're really at the beginning of your career. Um, so it's really important to us to engage with um, a multi-generational approach, let's say, because we really don't want to be a top-down organization. So it's very important that you're hearing from different people at all stages of their career in that process. Um, but um, so we have three levels, as I said, student, um, individual, small companies, um, and then larger organizations. Um, and those 
come in at different different price points. What we also do is the, the, the different prices don't dictate how many votes you get at the General Assembly. That's also important to us. So if you're a broadcaster and you buy um, a, a, a organization um, package, let's say, you only get five votes. It costs 500 euros and you get five votes. And it's the same if you purchase an individual um, membership that's 100 euros, you get one vote. So we try really hard to keep things kind of democratic so that um, voices aren't being, let's say, bombarded from one side. And then for the rest of this year, it says on the website that it's just until the, 20, um, the 31st of May, but we will extend it until the end of the year because it's so challenging. Um, membership fees are discounted 50%. So for an individual this year, it's only 50 euros, which I think is a good deal because what we're also doing is um, working on behalf of the members to secure good discounts for you guys. So we work with um, Sheffield Dock Fest and with Sunny Side of the Dock, um, with Biogra Film Festival um, in Italy. We'll also start collaborating with the Mia Markets. We collaborate with... Um, with the Mache um, du Film in Cannes and the discounts that you get on the passes to either attend those festivals this year, not face to face, but um, their um, online offerings is so significant that it actually cancels out your, um, your membership fee immediately. Um, we also have, we'll, we just will announce today a um, new partnership with Kickstarter that members will also have access to their experts for free to help people build um, crowdfunding campaigns, especially people affected by this crisis. Um, we have an, a deal with the Rough Cut service. Um, with um, The Rough Cut service is a collective of um, editors and people who work in dramaturgy, including Ika Veklahati, um, Niels Pag Anderson, et cetera, also for um, free webinars next week. So like there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of different things going on. We're just in the process of, um, publishing this information also on the website because um, I guess like every like there's no there's no corner of the audiovisual market that is left untouched by this crisis um, so of course that means that we're also affected so we had like a whole page of services to publish for you guys but now there's no I mean there's no point in offering you discounted accreditations to film festivals that don't exist so we're also just in the process of pivoting our moves but um, also, for the second half of this year, we plan to, to launch a pan-European study to understand the fallout of COVID on our industry. I hesitate, or we hesitated as an organisation to do it earlier, because we thought we also needed to have some time to see what these effects were, because there's no point in just having a survey that collects people's fear. Um, if you can't, if you don't have concrete evidence about what like the actual outcomes are. So we're just waiting a bit. So that's something to watch and to wait for. And then the other thing that I think is important is that um, we will have a board made up of five, an executive board of five. And at the moment, only three of the places on that executive board are actually taken. So um, we're working with Juliana Ugrin, who's a Hungarian producer. Hungar Hungary also just um, established a um, documentary guild or a nonfiction filmmakers guild this year. Um, so it's really interesting that there is um, an emergence again of these kind of grassroots organizations. I find it very exciting, to be honest. Um, and also um, the other person is Charlie Phillips from The Guardian, who I'm sure Ukrainian um, professionals are familiar with but we will be holding elections in November parallel to IDFA. So um, if you also feel like you would like to be involved in a, in a bigger level in this um, conversation and also trying to shape policy for nonfiction filmmaking more in general, we would love for you to identify yourself. Um, and then the other thing is there will be a second advisory board which will be made up more generally of people who feel like they have things to say, but are not ready to take um, steps to be part of the executive board. As I said, for us, it is extremely important that our mission and mandate is um, informed by multi layers of the industry and not a top down approach of three or four people telling you how to organize your lives and businesses. 
And that's because this is a pan-European international network where not every market works the same way and where the needs of every market is not the same. And it was really important to us that the countries of large audiovisual output didn't get to dictate the conversation too much. So this is the way we try to, to make it more fair. I also am issuing in this discussion an invitation to my colleagues from the other networks, um, Heilika, particularly from you from Estonia and um, Lubo, because I see you in front of me. I would really like to organize a summit for all of the European, pan European, extended European documentary associations and guilds. And I would like to do it by the end of the year. Um, it was something that I thought that maybe we would do in 2021 in a physical meeting space. But now actually I think the reality that we live in requires us to collaborate much more quickly. Um, and I hope that, that you would join me on this um, journey because I think it would be good to really have a, a one day or two days where we come together and compare the resources that we already have and identify what the gaps are in both our knowledge and our skill set and um, in the data that we have so that we can go out really hard after this crisis and demand the things that um, are rightly ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. We have a question from a viewer. I think this viewer is also in documentary. Uh, is very well versed in it. First of all, there is European Documentary Network, and the question is, what is the difference uh, between the activity of uh, your association and the one we just mentioned? Sure. I mean, the, 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 the fundamental difference is that at the moment, the Documentary Association of Europe is um, formed as a grassroots movement from um, people within the industry who are working right now who feel like their voice is not heard on a policy level at the European Union. Um, and the European Union and the media program funds much more than just projects that are happening within the, the borders of this European Union. Um, and so that, that is really our number one goal to start really lobbying professionally and properly from 2021. And so that's why, as I said, this, this idea that it's a bottom-up organization that comes from people who want to engage with the process is something that I don't think that the EDN really is, that, that that's the European Documentary Network, which is more about providing training and information for, for filmmakers, I think. But I can really only speak on behalf of my organization. And, and for us, it's really important that, that, um, that cultural policy and that economic policy around um, audiovisual output in Europe is informed by and um, driven by people working in the industry that we take our economy back um, and thus by taking our economy back also take the politics back um, and that also I think um, something that Heilika also said that I Heilika said that I find so so interesting is that it's not just about building good relationships with your direct funders, with your commissioner, but also building a relationship um, um, in this kind of divided genre or um, output world, which to me, I, I'm really questioning now if it's good that like, I wouldn't call it a ghetto, but you know, we're just working on behalf of nonfiction filmmakers, but like we have to go out with that voice really strong because the fiction voices are so strong and so if people who are not working in our workflows are dictating like the cultural policy, then it can be really, really damaging for um, our particular industries. So building also these relationships across the genre fields is something that we're going to be really actively doing, um, getting out beyond just our documentary community and participating in conversations with things like the European Producers Club, which is already happening. And I find really crucial to keep the, the, to make sure that we're not just working inside our own echo chamber. Are there more questions? 
Thank you, Bridget. For your answer, I think we have a couple more minutes. May I ask a question? I think everyone can join the conversation now and maybe if you want to ask one another some questions and Wait. I see. May, may I begin? Oh, I just will. Um, so to my, my colleagues from Ukraine and um, Estonia, like, uh, I think actually, Halika, you are already a member, and I think Luke and DocuDays are certainly a member of, of European Documentary Association. But can you tell me maybe like why you think it's in our interest to also do cross-border collaboration? And what you would expect of a of a cross-border or, or a pan-European organization? And why you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? You can start. <laughs> Alika, you can start. You have just about 30 seconds. I have to think a little bit. Luba. I think that we shouldn't really try and create something extraordinary. We just need to try to draw positive experience that have already happened, like Estonia and other countries. We need to use the existing experience and sort of reuse it in Ukraine and uh, share the findings that we will have, but also try to borrow the experience from uh, from our international counterparts. There's a lot of experts in Ukraine and cr in crisis situations. So you can ask us about that already. I think we run it out of time here and I want to thank everyone that has been with us today. Thank you, Halika. Thank you, Bridget and Luba. I really hope that Ukrainian Nonfiction Cinema Guild will be developing and borrowing the best experience from, from the international counterparts and will be able to join the international action here that are started by Documentary Association of Europe in particular. I also want to remind you that tomorrow at 5 p.m. we will be talking about distribution and documentary film market after the lockdown. I will be moderating the conversation and we will have many participants from across the world and we'll be talking about what are we supposed to do in this complicated situation? And just a quick reminder that you can vote for the movies at DocuDay's website. There is going to be a viewer's award and tomorrow at the close of the line, you will be able to see who is the winner in different competitions. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you DocuDay's for letting us do this. Everyone stay healthy and safe.